Can you hear me? Perfect. Uh, yes, I can. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> How's it going? It goes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, two minutes more here and we'll get started. Okay. Oh, I see here that Nicholas Lake said that this is where special ed teachers were directed to go yesterday during new teacher orientation. So this is actually for the um, site administrators. I'm just gonna be covering information regarding the dashboard and how they can look up things. Um, on Monday, we have a, an all day training at Lowell with all of the staff. And at that training, I will be doing a training for special ed teachers regarding caseloads and writing IEPs and you know all of the documentation that's necessary. So this one is geared directly for school site administrators. Um, oh, um, all right. Yeah, yesterday they told us to come today and that we would be able to get training in SACE and we'd be able to get access to it today. Yeah, that's actually on Monday um, at the Lowell training. It's going to be held at Lowell. Right. So they so they were wrong. They in were telling wrong. us that yesterday. <laughs> yes. This one is definitely for site admin. Brian, do you think it might be helpful for these folks to come to your next session on service tracker? You could come to the the 10 what time is it? 11 o'clock session mm -hmm. on service tracker. If you're an RSP teacher, you're going to need to be able to, to track your services using service tracker would be the most efficient way to do that. And you'd be welcome to attend that. Um, that one is the one after this starting at 11. Um, but yeah, on Monday for sure. And Nick or Nicholas, are you new to the district? No. I've been working for the district for 10 years. I'm new to te I'm new to being a certificated teacher. I've been a okay. para for 10 years. Okay, so you've been a para for 10 years. Yeah. You haven't been certificated previously. Um, all right, so on Monday for sure, you can get that training and I can create your account. I can even create your account now, but not give you your permissions or today. Um, so, there's another, so there's, so I, there's nothing for me to learn here. I'm not allowed to be in this session or. You can stay. You're welcome to stay if you want to. Okay. Um, and there are, are things that I think you could benefit from knowing from this, this, but this is geared toward the site of admin, just okay. so you know. Thank you. Um, what school are you at? Uh, I'm going to be uh, starting at Willie Brown Middle School. Willie Brown. Okay. All right, so I can create that account for you. It'll be a provider account. Um, and then you can you can have at least that account to go through and look at different. Do you know your caseload yet? No. Okay, so when you get your caseload, we need to know that so that we can assign them. That's a manual process. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Do we have any other teachers here today? Do we have any site admin? I 
So this is interesting. <laughs> Some mixed message went out there, I'm sure. It doesn't, so Brian, were there any, I wasn't quite looking. If there are no site administrators, I do wonder if we might want to think about using the time differently. Yeah, I could switch it up and I could actually do something with, um, for the service providers, if we don't have site admin here, the actual teachers um, who are here. So Nicholas, you need it. Katie, are you a teacher also? No, I just wanted to know a little bit more about um, SACE and stuff, only because we always have questions about special ed students on uh, Synergy. And your position is what? I'm a senior business analyst. Oh, okay. Great. So, so one would be helpful for you. Yeah, either one would be helpful for you. Carol you know, knows all things it? SACE, so we don't need to worry about Carol. <laughs> <laughs> Elena, are you still at um, O'Connell teaching? Maybe stepped away. <laughs> and I know that Patricia Patty was here. I guess she dropped out. She's definitely at O'Connell. So I don't know about El Elena. Um, I'm at O'Connell. You're at O'Connell? I am. Okay. And you're, are you a teacher? Also, I'm a teacher and I'm um, going to be switching into department head this year. Oh, oh, OK. So this is good. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to switch it up and go to let me stop sharing that screen. And I'm just going to switch it over. going to SACE. I'm just going to do it this way. All right. And let me share screen again. Okay, so now you should be seeing a SACE screen. You have that? Uh, yep. Okay. All right. And if we do get administrators, I can still use this to, um, to talk about this. When you get your SACE account, so Nicholas, you don't have a SACE account yet. Um, I'm going to make it right now, Brian. Okay. Haiti, do you have an account? I think you do, don't you? Yes, I do. Thank you. Okay. And Elena, do you have an account? I have an account, but I need the Al Access account to the um, school site. Yeah, for this, you'll need a school site account. Yes. Yes. Let's, um, if we could get that created today too, that'll help you out a lot. So then Patty's not going to do that this year. No, but I'm very lucky to have her. Still around. <laughs> yes. Okay. O'Connell. All right. Okay, so when you, I guess everyone else has logged into SACE except Nicholas. And when you log in the first time, Nicholas, you will see the same type of screen. Only your name is going to be up here in the right hand top corner. Um, and if you click on your name, you're going to be able to change your your password and update your profile. But let's cover first what is on just a little bit of this page. Um, we have this black toolbar that shows us students, searches, reports, goals, reference, service tracker, training materials, and contact SACE. Um, and then we have these different topics. We have in the top left corner here of the dashboard or home screen, requests submitted by two district SELPA. So you're gonna to have to re submit requests through SACE to have students added or removed from your caseload 
or to have a service provider added, um, Nick, Nicholas, you will have to do that. Actually, Elena, as the department chair at O'Connell, you're going to have the ability to, to assign providers and case managers and remove them. Okay. And I'll send, we'll send you some information on how to do that. Yes. I have kids that graduated two years ago and I've asked them to be dropped for two years and they're still there. So it makes my list really long. Can you email me that, that list of those people directly? Just email it directly okay. to me. Okay. And I can Thank take you. care of that for you. Um, okay. So when you submit a request, it would either be an ad request an exit request is would be done if a student no longer qualifies for special education, and that would be the result of some assessment. Um, or if an exit request would be submitted if the student's parent revokes consent. Parents have the right to revoke consent. If they say we no longer want special ed services, then we are required to honor that. They need to put that in writing. That would be an exit request. Um, an exit request would be done if a student moves to another district outside of San Francisco. So um, you would just be submitting that as the, the reason for the request. Records changes are if, if you should be removed because you're no longer seeing that student, if somebody else should be made the case manager, you, we need to know the name of that case manager in those cases. Um, we can't remove a case manager without identifying the next case manager. The system won't allow us to do that. Eligibility changes are for students who have either an initial IEP or who no longer qualify. That's another way to do that exit. Um, so if a student has is having their very first IEP, the initial one, and they are found to, to qualify for services, then that would be an eligibility change. We have to change them. They're listed in pending during that time of evaluation in SACE. Um, and if they're determined to be eligible, then an eligibility request needs to be submitted. However, let me, let me qualify that. During that time of assessment, it's either going to be the speech pathologist or the, the um, school psychologist that should be leading that process. So we should not have, you guys should not have to make those request changes. It should be your school psychologist or speech person in those cases. If it's an exit because the student no longer qualifies after an assessment, a triennial assessment, for example, um, then you would be submitting that as an exit and the reason that the student no longer qualifies and is, um, is returned to general ed. Nick, are you Nick or Nicholas? Uh, either is fine. Okay. Uh, oh, uh, uh, either is fine. Sorry. Okay. If uh, either one is fine, so if I am working with you know my population of students, if I'm working you know in push-in support or whatever in a classroom, and if I identify a student in general population who oh well it looks like this kid might benefit like you know this is the initial child find i then i report that person to the school speech language pathologist or the school psychologist and say hey i think this kid might need an initial assessment yeah you have the ability to do that anyone can yeah. can request that a student be referred for assessment um and then that assessment process would would start if the team is in agreement. So there are different ways that that happens. Anyone can make the request. It doesn't mean that the student's necessarily always going to be assessed automatically. Sure. Yeah. It yeah. needs to be some, some evaluation that looks mm -hmm. into that and helps to determine, should we move forward with assessment or not? Can um, I add a piece in here, Brian, as certainly. well? Um, Nicholas, are you in uh, elementary or secondary? Uh, secondary, it'll, it'll be uh, middle school. Okay, so usually at the school, you have um, students assess team, you have other internal uh, support uh, in evaluating whether there's, there are challenges posed by the student. And if the school have done uh, some minimum work uh, to scaffold to support before you automatically refer a child to assessment. So you may want, once you start school, check with your um, administration 
uh, to see what process they have in place. To, uh, there are a couple of steps you may need to go through before you automatically refer, uh, because there needs to be some internal in-house support, uh, demonstrator support, uh, before we directly refer a child to special ed for assessment. Oh, okay, great. That makes sense, right? Because we're building yeah. the lower levels on universal design for learning. So building more universal scaffolding supports to lessen the need for acute special education. Okay. Right. Also, you need to provide evidence that yeah. you have done enough and there are still challenges that yeah. might require additional support. Okay, thank you. Thank sure. you, Carol. That's that's important. One of the, the next process, step in that process, though, is that either the school psychologist or speech pathologist is going to need to create if the team is in agreement that the student should be considered for assessment or assessed, um, they're going to need to create what is called an assessment plan. They do that. As a teacher, you don't create that document. You participate in that. And then once the teacher or once the school psychologist or speech pathologist creates that document, it needs to be sent to the parents. The parents need to sign it. Upon receipt of the signed assessment plan by the, the parent, that's when the, the, the processing can begin for the, the um, to, to begin to assess the student. No assessment can be done for a student without written parent consent in signing that um, assessment plan. When we get it back signed, the school psychologist or speech pathologist needs to update, upload it as an attachment to the IEP record that has been created in SACE. Um, and then a 60-day window of time kicks in upon receipt of the signed assessment plan. And within that 60 days, all assessments need to be completed, all reports need to be written, and the IEP meeting needs to be held. I want to be specific here because those six that 60 day period are calendar days under the law. They are not work days. So the only way we get a break from that is if we have a, a time that school is not in session for greater than five days. The only time that happens in San Francisco is over winter break or Christmas break. That's a two week break. The only other time is over the summer. Spring break is a five-day break. Thanksgiving is a five-day break. Any of those incidental holidays that happen are just a one-day break. So the only time we have that we cannot count those days, calendar days, is during winter break and over the summer. Otherwise, all break periods count, including weekends. So it really shortens that length of time. Just know that. Um, but your school psychologist or speech person should be leading that process at that point. Okay. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. I'll just go ahead and hold the rest of my questions until the end because you'll probably answer them. Thank you very much. That was very okay. thorough. Address changes. SACE is a, a program, and I'll get there in a moment. But SACE is a program that's developed for the state of California, and, and most of California uses it. 99 more than 99% of California uses SACE. That's why we use it. They can do address changes in other districts and other counties in California through SACE. We cannot. We cannot in San Francisco because we're a single district SELPA. That's not going to mean a lot to you right now. But we have school choice. And because of the school choice, um, synergy is what controls our demographic information. So the address, the parent's name, parent's telephone numbers, all of that information is controlled by our Synergy program. Um, and unless the, the address is changed in Synergy, you can change it in SACE. And there's a nightly exchange of information between SACE and Synergy. It's going to revert back to whatever is in Synergy. Um, so it will it will clear out any changes you made on the demographics page, and that's page one of the IEP document, the information and eligibility page. Okay, so know that parents are required to present verification of residency in San Francisco because of the school choice. 
So that's why that's like that. And the next one here is this IEP CalPADS requests. If there's a CalPADS request through the process that is used in CalPADS, and I'll get into that in a few minutes, um, you will automatically be directed to submit that kind of a request if needed. So the system will say, choose this as your request and just submit it. And you don't have to do anything more with that. We deal with that centrally. But then if you have numbers here and you've, you've actually submitted any requests, you'd have numbers. And if you click on that number, it will tell you the status of the request, whether we have responded to it yet, whether it's been completed or not. Um, but that gives you the ability to track the requests that you submit. Let me just stop here for a moment and go up here to the black toolbar, go to training materials. I'm going to click on training materials and come back and then click again on training materials, which will take me to this manual list. And I'm gonna to go to teacher materials. And then I'm gonna to go to provider level training. This hasn't been updated yet for the coming school year, but it will be very soon. And I just wanna, cover a few of these slides. Is that big enough? So SACE stands for Special Education Information System. It's really just a holding tank of information where IEPs can be written and housed during the course of, of a student being in special ed. All of these areas in green use SACE as their mechanism to write IEPs. There are only three counties here that do not use SACE. Um, and um, it makes it, we use it because it makes it much easier to get IEPs and to get information. When we have a student come from any of these counties or any of these school districts who use SACE in, in California, we can do an online search for those students through SACE, we can find that they have a, a record somewhere, and we can request that that record be transferred to us, and they do that within a couple of days, and we get everything. We get the current IEP, all of the past IEPs, all assessments, everything that is on that student for all of the years that they've had IEPs are there, and we get it electronically and immediately almost. Prior to SACE, we had to either get faxes or we had to wait until things were sent through the mail to us. So the, the beauty of SACE in California is this interchange of information. So if a student leaves us and goes to another district somewhere in California that uses SACE, they will do that statewide search. They'll request the record and we will transfer it to them. So it's an interchange of information that happens very quickly. That's really important because under the federal law, we are required to provide the service that is in the current IEP from the day the student enrolls with our district. Now we can't do that if we don't have the IEP. And oftentimes parents don't have a copy of the IEP when they come. So this has really helped us with expediency and not having to rewrite everything. Um, it was developed by a, a company called CodeStack, which is out of the San Joaquin County Office of Education. It's a private nonprofit agency. They've developed a number of different educationally based um, programs like this. So they own SACE. And we pay a fee yearly per student to use SACE. It's a web-based data entry system. So there are rules about web-based systems. Um, don't use this back button. If you're, if you're editing anything in SACE, if you do, it's going to erase everything you've edited. Um, nothing is more frustrating. There are forward and back buttons within the program. Um, you can't open multiple tabs of SACE with your username, so it won't let you do that. It'll let you make changes 
so that you can compare. Sometimes you want to compare things that are on different pages of SACE. Um, but if you do that and you open two different tabs or even open another, using another browser open and go back into SACE with your, your um, username and password, it's going to know that it's you. It's going to let you make changes, but it's not going to be sure what to do with those changes and it'll muddy things up. So Elena, for you, you have a little bit of an advantage here because you're going to have two accounts. You'll have your provider account still, and then you'll have your site account. So you'll actually be able to open two different tabs if you sign in under both accounts. So you would sign in under your provider account and then sign in again under your, your site account, and you would be able to make that comparison. But um, if you don't have two accounts, you're not going to be able to do that. So typically, teachers only have a provider account. There's only one account because that's all that's necessary for teachers. Yes, Elena. I, I have in the past used it to like say I want to reference a pre, another person's IEP. Like, oh, I really like the goal I wrote for this other kid and they're in the same class. I'll do that and open two windows just so that I can be more efficient with my time. Okay, you could do that because you're going into two different records. And you're probably not going to be editing too much in the other one, right? You're just using that as a reference. So absolutely. I, I think for me, the, the reference really always is too when you're, when you're having that um, present levels of performance page, page two of the IEP, and you're writing the pre present levels of performance in, when you go to write your goals, those present levels of performance should be the baseline for your goals. So you want to be able to like look at that and use that information, right? That's why this gets hard. I think the other thing that you could do, Nick, in a case like this, is you can always download that page and then pull it up and have it there for yourself so that you can make that reference. So if you want to if you want to make that reference using the present levels of performance page, you'll have the option to download that page to your desktop or your your um, computer and then you can pull up that download when you're writing the goals page. So that's that's a way to do it to work around that. Um, internet security it's an online program, obviously. It's password protected, but you still have to be aware of that. So I, I don't want to go into that too much. The intent of SACE is to really tell the story of the student from the day they're referred to special ed until the day they exit. And either they would exit because their parent withdraws them, or they've tested out and no longer need the service, or they graduate, um, or they age out of our system. So there are a lot of things there, ways that students can exit. Um, the other thing is that every meeting in, is documented on a single student record. So that's really good. So when transfers occur, anything happens, all of that information follows them and you can really see the history of the student that way. Another thing is that SACE does compliance checks or error checks. We have to report to CalPADS, which is the state system that reports to the state and the federal government for reimbursement. And we can't have errors in our reporting under the law. That's the way the law is written. And SACE provides an error check as you're filling out the documents because the documents, the pages of SACE that you fill out for each student um, get translated into, into CalPADS pages where the data is pulled from. Um, and that data has to be 100% accurate for reporting purposes. So they have compliance checks that are built in and it will tell you if you have errors, it will tell you what those errors are um, so that you can remediate those before right. you um, you submit that. Yes, Carol. Brian, I'm going to ask you to pause a minute uh, because there's a lot of information. I'm going to see if Haiti and uh, Nicholas, you have questions. It'll be good to pause here. If you have questions, there's a lot of information. I, I appreciate all the information that Brian's uh, providing right now. Thank you. Okay. Uh, 
I mean, I was, I, I was just curious about, I had, I was curious about what, how to avoid the errors and if we were going to see kinds of errors. But again, as I said, I can just hold my questions until the end. I figured they'd probably get answered. So I'm just doing my best to follow along and pay attention and I'll, if there's time at the end for questions I'll, or later on, I'll ask them then. But no, for now, I'm just going to follow along. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Thank man. you, Carol. I need these checks to slow down. I I know I need those. <laughs> I tend to just ramble it all out. And it's a tremendous amount of information. When you walk away from this today, you're going to have tons of questions. And as you begin this process, you're going to have even more questions. That's okay. Know that. Um, ask them because it, it is very important that you that you're doing the best you can to get everything correct. I've been doing this for 45 years. And so it, it comes to me in a different way. And yet I make mistakes. So know that that human error is there. It's okay. They change things a lot. And as they make changes, it gets confusing sometimes. But never be afraid to ask. Never. And also know this, that any errors you make can be corrected. There are processes to correct them. So don't panic too much about that. Okay, this last thing here is that following SACE best practices will ensure that the IEP has the student's most up-to-date information. Um, and that's really a good thing because we need to have the most current information. IEPs need to be current. Every IEP expires after a one-year period. If it's expired, that's problematic. If an IEP doesn't is held and doesn't get affirmed, that's problematic because the state doesn't recognize that that IEP was held, um, and the federal government doesn't under, doesn't recognize that it was held. If a, an IEP is unsigned by the parent, that's a problem because although we can affirm it for a student who is currently eligible for services, we can't implement the services that are in that IEP unless we have parent signature. That's federal law. So we those are very important items um, that we really need to, to um, move through. So IEP data is reported to CalPEDS through SACE. It's reported by every IEP that you hold or amendment that you hold, and it's called affirming. When you affirm an IEP, whether it's an annual, triennial, initial, um, whether it's an amendment, that creates what is called in SACE a transaction. And that transaction is reported to CalPADS. And it's reported to CalPADS as it occurs. So know that. It's called transactional reporting. IEPs, as I noted, are good for a one-year period. So today is August 9th, 2023. That if we have an IEP today, August 9th, 2023, it will be good until the end of the day on August 8th, 2024. After that period of time, it's overdue. So we need to hold the next annual IED on IEP on or before August 8th, 2024 to stay in compliance with that, okay? We have a couple of times a year that, that CalPEDS specifically looks at our data. They collect it all year long as these transactions are being created. But we have what is called Census Day, which is the first Wednesday of October every year. Um, and that's for students who are enrolled for the current year, anytime from July 1st through that first Wednesday of October. I don't know what that date is this year. I know it was August 5th last year, but I'm not sure about this year. Um, and we have to have minimally for that student, a current IEP that has been affirmed. We need one transaction minimally for every student that's enrolled as of October, the first Wednesday of October. Um, it's October 4th. October 4th this year. So by October 4th, we need to have at least one 
transaction for every student that's currently enrolled with us. Now that can be prior to July 1st, if they had an IEP in, you know, any time before July 1st, 2020, let me think here, before August of, I mean, October of 2022. If they had an IEP up until that October date, 2022, we are okay. If they have, if they don't have a, um, an IEP since, since before October of 2022, then we're going to be in trouble and we're not going to have a transaction. So we need to get that squared away um, and be aware of that. And then at the end of the year, June 30th is the end of the technical end of the fiscal year, actually, so that we have to have an, a transaction, any transactions going after October 4th this year, um, 2023, until June 30th get counted in that one. Okay. I know that's confusing. Don't worry about it. Um, you don't have to worry about that. That's, that's, our responsibility. So Brian, for case managers, it's important that you conduct IEP prior to the annual IEP date. That's exactly right. I think that's right. how we would summarize it. Uh, yes. If you know your annual um, IEP date is coming up, you need to conduct your IEP, your next IEP, before the expiration of the annual date. You will be then in compliance and affirming your IEP once you conduct your IEP meeting, you must affirm within seven days. Otherwise, it is not noted and you will be out of compliance. So the, affirming the IEP is the most critical thing you could do following your IEP meeting because that registers it. If you do not, then it's void. It's, it's not visible. That's um, right. So I think that those are kind of key points for case managers at the site level. Uh, conduct your IEP before the expiration of the annual IEP day. Affirm it within seven days after your meeting, whether you have a signed IEP or not. You affirm in says that you conducted the meeting. That counts. That's right. And then as long as you do that, exactly what Carol's saying, you'll stay in compliance and you won't have to worry about things at all. Okay. Um, so a transaction's created, and I touched on this, when the IEP is affirmed, the initial annual or triennial, it can be an annual and triennial in one same meeting. If it's an initial, it's only an initial. There's no other way, nothing else, because that's the very first IEP that a student's going to have. And they can only have one initial um, IEP. When a student's exited, there are a number of different reasons, and I covered those previously. Um, when a status changes, so if a student is being assessed for services and they are determined that they do not qualify, DNQ means do not qualify, that IEP never gets affirmed if it's an initial IEP. So know that, and it would be an initial IEP in that case. So that's something that, again, because it's an initial IEP, either the speech pathologist or school psychologist will be handling that. So, but know that if you have an initial IEP and the student doesn't qualify for services, or even if they do qualify for services, but the parent says, no, they don't want it, then that student never, you, you never have to affirm that IEP. So you don't have to worry about that it goes away. We actually hold it in a suspense file. Um, so it doesn't go entirely away because they may be referred for assessment again. Um, so during the time that a student is listed as pending, this is when they're that before that initial IEP has been held, their meeting type should be plan type 30. Their meeting type should be 30. Their plan type should be 300. And that's initial assessment. That's waiting for the initial assessment to be completed. Okay. But again, that's something that your, your school psychologist and or speech person should be handling. This is just info for you to further make the information more complex. Um, when an amendment is affirmed and IPP plan fields are updated. So if you have an 
an amendment IEP and you're changing something, um, you just need to fill out those pages of the IEP plan. And I can get into this more later um, or on Monday. Um, just those pages that are being changed. You don't have to change the entire IEP document. So for example, if you're adding a service to an IEP, that one service would be added, or if it's service that's already existing is going to be increased or decreased, then you would stop the service the way that it's written. You'd end it and you would complete the service grid indicating what the new service is and use that start date of that, that amendment but the end date would still be the end date of that IEP annual date, whatever that is. And I know that's not gonna make a lot of sense right now, but it will um, in the future. So case managers renewing, reviewing and validating the IEP information before you affirm is very, very important. It's a seven step process to affirm an IEP going to ask you specifically about dates. It's going to ask you the plan type. It's going to ask you the meeting type. And that's all there. And you need to check, actually check a box affirming that that's correct. Take that seriously. Look at it carefully and make sure that it's all correct as you're checking those boxes. It's going to ask you if the parent signed. If the parent did sign, just check yes. If the parent si did not sign, check no and keep moving through that, that process. So if the parent didn't sign within that seven day period, as Carol noted, um, but they sign on the eighth day or the 12th day or sometime after that seven day period, you need to go back in and mark that IEP signed. And it's literally one dot that you're going to update. You don't have to do anything else with it. So it's, it's, it's an easy process, and I can talk more about that. I will talk more about that on Monday. Um, the IEP should be as, affirmed as soon as possible after the meeting's completed. You don't have to wait seven days. Seven days is the max that you should wait. But if you're ready to affirm it immediately after the meeting, affirm it. That's fine. Um, there's no reason to, to hold off on that and submit the student change requests as soon as eligibility is determined or the student is exiting. So if, if it's an initial IEP and the student is listed as pending, but they should be changed to eligible after the IEP, it's been confirmed that the student should receive services or will be receiving services and that IEP meeting's been held, everyone's in agreement, then that change request form should go in. We cannot make a student eligible until the parent signs an agreement for the, the initial IEP. Just know that. That signature page needs to either be a wet signature, an actual pen to paper signature that gets uploaded as an attachment to that IEP, or an electronic signature through SACE. If you use the electronic signature through SACE, it is going to take the full seven days. If you have the wet signature where the parent signed after the meeting, if it's an in-person meeting, then you can upload that and you can immediately request the eligibility change. Again, that's probably going to be the speech person or the school psych, um, but you may work with them on that too. It's not; It doesn't have to be one or the other. Um, if a student is exiting, it's also important to note when a student is exiting and do it as quickly as possible because if it's been determined that a student should no longer receive services because they no longer qualify we need to exit them as quickly as possible um, the law says that we should not be providing services for any student who no longer or doesn't qualify for special ed um, i'm not going to go into all that today uh, managing your profile. All right, this is the last slide that I'm going to talk about from here, and that is provider level users. So everyone that that is um, either a case manager or a provider, and that's service providers, 
um, for the students, we need to be able to assign them as a member of that student's team for legal purposes. So if you have an OT, a PT, a speech person, a behaviorist, school psychologist, any of those people, you as a special ed teacher or case manager um, or anyone, a nurse sometimes, a deaf and hard of hearing teacher, any service provider needs to have what is called a provider level account or provider level users. So if you're the case manager, you're the person, and as the SPED teacher, nine times out of 10, you are going to be the case manager. You're going to be that person who communicates with the IEP team so that they're aware of the timelines for the IEP. So knowing, going in, checking the dates of when the IEPs are coming due, because you're going to have to, to have your school site administrator, a school site administrator present at the IEP meeting, the parent or educational rights holder, you're going to have to be there. At least one general ed teacher who works with that student needs to be present and any other related service providers. So those need to those meetings need to be scheduled in advance because you have the date that it's going to be due, but you also, these other folks have to be present or you can't hold the meeting. So schedules need to be coordinated. So it's very important that at the very start of the year, when you get your caseload, you look at the, all of the IEP dates that are coming due and you will have IEPs all year long, every year for every student um, and schedule that out for the entire year as soon as possible. Get it to your site administrator, get it to those related service providers, arrange it with the parents probably a month or so before that meeting date so that you know that you can hold the meeting. Otherwise, you're, you're, if you don't do that, people are going to get booked. Site, site staff who are the administrators at the site have a, a, a big job and they get booked and one of them has to be there and, and it's hard. The related service providers have huge caseloads and it's hard for them and they may be juggling more than just the school that you work at um, too. So we need to be conscious of that and do our best to always schedule that as much as possible ahead of time. You get a 30-day warning on SACE, but 30 days is not long enough for an annual IEP, for sure. And then you're going to also be the person who affirms and attests. We always just say affirm, but it's called affirm and attest the IEPs, amendments, and progress reports. Um, and we'll talk about what each of those are. And let me just do it here. So an, an annual IEP or triennial IEP are the IEPs. Those are where the documents are done in the future IEP. An amendment is if you have an IEP that's a current IEP, you can't make changes to that document. So in order to make changes, you have to have what is called an amendment. And that amendment you would access through the current IEP. And I'll show you that in a, in a minute. Um, and then you would change just those parts of the IEP that need to be changed. Progress reporting is reporting on the goals that are in the IEP. The frequency of that needs to match whenever students get report cards. So at the, at the elementary level, I think it's every nine weeks. At the middle school level and the high school level, I think it's every six weeks. I'm not exactly sure anymore what those reporting periods are. But the, the time frame needs to match report cards. Um, and the law says that progress on goals. So all you're doing is writing progress on the goals that you provide. If a speech person has a goal and they're providing that service, they need to write their pro progress or OT or PT, or if they get counseling or whomever, you are only writing progress on the goals that you implement, but you're going to be the person as the case manager who affirms those and they need to be affirmed or they don't get noted. Elena? I have a question. So yes. if you say speech or therapy or any service, one isn't being provided, like for example, ERM's person, they haven't met this year and we're in, you know, halfway through the year. 
Mm -hmm. or the speech pathologist is not reporting on the goals and this mm -hmm. has been all year and you're having your annual and do you not print them? You, what you, you, would, you wouldn't have anything to print. So you, you, you don't would, print those ones. Yeah, you would you would just simply say, you know, there's nothing to report. The service has not been offered. And that's a whole different thing because if you have that happen and that happens because we've been short of speech therapists, we've been short of different people throughout time, right? Um, when you don't have the service being provided, the only thing that you can do is document that it's not being provided. That's a separate issue in terms of how that's going to be dealt with um, and how the, the compensation for the lack of services will be provided in the future. But it's not all you can do in the IEP document is, is note that, you know, it hasn't happened. Other so than I, that, my question is, do I print them blank and leave them there as, or do I just leave them out like they weren't goals? I would just leave them out in all honesty, because if you print them out blank, I mean, you could do it either way, but it because just, then I can't change those goals either. No, you can't. And, and I've had goals, shouldn't. I'm in high school. I teach high, I do high school and I've had goals that are like a seventh grade or elementary school goal. And like for last year, we didn't have, um, a lot of mental health providers. Mm -hmm. So kids weren't receiving services. And when I go into that meeting, I have to be very honest. Like, this oh, yeah. Is a oh, I, you're so you're saying have. when you go into the IEP meeting? Yeah. What do oh, I yeah. do that parent? Yeah, I would definitely like, oh. print them out for the IEP meeting. Absolutely. Yes. I thought you were talking progress reports. Yes. No. I would be completely upfront about that. And I would be completely upfront about that. You're the department chair. So I would bring that to the to your your site admin. I would bring that to your supervisor, your SPED supervisor for that section, um, and let people know that we have this vacancy. These services, these are the services that are not being provided because that's not yours to deal with as the teacher or even the department chair. Right, but that's, we're the face of that. And yes, that, yes, yeah. you are the face of it. So that's why you need the others to address that. So your site admin should be addressing that or an admin from speech or an admin from um, the mental health side. Somebody else should be addressing that. It shouldn't be you in that meeting. In terms right. of the compensation, that's a different process. It's not in the IEP. And no? I offer a suggestion, Elena, you're stepping into a new New road this year, it sounds like, and it's going to be big. You have 134 students at O'Connell with IEP. It's huge. It's, and it so is. It's about a, I mean, we only have less than 500 kids. I know. It's 20, what is it? 27.35% of your student populations have an IEP. So uh, in terms of being the department head now, you got the big responsibility, one, to make sure all IEPs are in compliance, which means goals and all that. Most of the time, we find out of compliance because of timeline. We miss timelines. We miss affirming things. or We miss holding the IEP. So we're trying to provide the site leaders with some tools of a master schedule template. So we all know in August, how many IEP must be done by August? How many needs to be done by September? And if they're clustered too closely, can we spread them out? And it should be a shared drive. So you're all your all your service providers are entering their IEP due dates, annual due dates into this calendar. And then there's gonna track it. You held a meeting on this day, within seven days, did you affirm it? So as a department head, you have a quick lens to say, hey, we did this meeting, you didn't affirm it. Can you get to this? Because okay, most of the time- So I appreciate everything you're telling me because right now at the end of the last year, one teacher got sick for like three months and didn't take care you know, couldn't take care of that and another teacher came up to me and I said I really appreciate you coming to my IEP meetings you know I, I love that support how are yours going and he told me um, in May he hadn't held one that year so that means that many of my teachers are new teachers coming in and no one was checking if they were taking care of business and now those cases go to new people Yes, and we lose track of them even further, right? So we're going to try to be helpful to provide you guys with some type of tracker so you have 
on a monthly basis, you know, hey, we got IEPs that were supposed to be due in August. Did you guys hold this meeting? And by the way, please schedule them so that I can make it to this meeting in a reasonable manner. And so we're hoping to provide you with some tools because it's, it's huge uh, and we see it. And it's really hard to track even when you're on site because your service providers sometimes are itinerant staff and they're not all there talking to you on a daily basis, but a common drive where you could check in, they could input stuff and you could get on them and say seven days, hey, you go in and affirm that IEP. And, and so hopefully we'll get some more tools that's gonna be beneficial. Um, so, um, yeah, I just want to acknowledge how big the role is that you're stepping in, but I want to also do a, a, a check on time, uh, Brian, yeah. uh, session is <laughs> over at 1055. Yeah. So we want to leave time for a question and answer. And I know there's a big session on Monday for our yeah. ed teachers. I, I think it's uh, probably going to be best if we, if we hold things until Monday and I'll be available on Monday. There is a time slot that I have that's, I think, three hours long, actually. So we have we have a lot of time on Monday that we can continue with this and and get any questions um, answered. Nick, if you have a lot of questions that are just burning you, um, feel free to email me directly and I'll do my best to get those answered for you as soon as possible. And Elena, you too, um, actually. And, and thank you, Carol. That really helped. I really want to um, be as prepared to be because we're going to start in a deficit yes <laughs> yeah, I, i'm well. looking at the yeah. <laughs> and ju just know this though too I, but you know, understandably taught, understandably taught, it's overwhelming number yeah it's hard to track everything and yeah. all the kiddos but you got to have a tool that you could go into quick lens and just say boom i see all of you uh even if you're uh, yeah. not on site i see all of you and, right and, and that's so, great because it's also the way you described it it's not just I feel like teachers feel like it's for them, but really also including the providers means that you can see if there is, you know, not a provider for a group of children. Right. Yes. Address it in a group rather than one at a time. But ultimately, as the head of the department, it falls back on you. Compliance issues always falls back to the leaders. Uh, so we want to help the leaders to have the right tools. Uh, yeah. Well, like I said, there's nowhere going but up here. <laughs> <laughs> Just Good know like this, this too. I, I just have to say that I, I taught in San Francisco for many years. I taught in Boston. Um, you will always start the year with a deficit. There is no way around that. Even in the best of times, there will be a deficit every time. Yeah, O'Connell um, does have a high population of students with IEPs, 27.35. That's a high percentage. Yeah. We, don't, we acknowledge it, that. It's yeah, well, the way that our school's de designed is that each cohort or larger group has a special educator so parents are like I want that because my students get full access and that's what they really want so um I think we can do you know a good job at that even though <laughs> feel free to connect with us special ed and Brian and Danielle uh you know they're we're all here to help and, and I know the job is enormous and and competing priorities always on a daily basis Anything we can make it easier for you to monitor ultimately is what we want to do is monitoring services are provided and that we're right. in compliance. Well, if you guys have any advice on Monday, what, you know, what sessions I should take, I definitely will uh, take your advice. I love the idea of setting up the school calendar um, and making sure that everything's in there and also that teachers know that it includes providers, because I think that makes them feel like it's an, it's not eyes on you, it's eyes on what these kids are supposed to legally have. Mm -hmm. We hope to push out a template that, uh, for site leaders who are interested in having that quick glance. Uh, so don't invent the wheel. We yeah. might have something already. We're going to try to push it out and, and make it accessible for those who want to use it. Excellent. I think. Thank you. Elena, me. I'll flag one thing right now is that there's going to be a session offered twice on Monday um, about creating legally defensible IEPs and like what are the like pitfalls of that so I feel like that's something that you should probably um, plan to attend yeah and Nick, I would say for you you should probably plan to attend both the SAFE training because there's a lot more detail that you're going to need and the Woodcock Johnson training because Woodcock Johnson is is something that you're going to have to be doing 
Um, well, and training, here. because when, when I was a pathway teacher, I was an emergency credential teacher, and and nobody teaches you about the Woodcock Johnson. Right. So we're going to offer both on Monday. Um, that might be helpful for Nicholas as well, I think. Yeah. Those right. And so you got to fit in. How do I train? How do I model a six hour <laughs> in one hour sessions and not take this kid out of the same class and not right. remove this person from providing service? Right. Like you said, a million things that have to happen at the same time. Right. Um, OK. Well, we are totally out of time and we have our next session starting. So we're going to have to get out of here. We'll Bye. see you on Monday. Bye. Bye.